Amen. All right, let's grab our Bibles. We're in the book of James. For those of you that are just joining us this morning in the house or online, uh, in the book of James, we, we find out some incredible practical ex expressions of how to live a Christian life. Now, in case you haven't figured it out, sometimes this Christian life can be difficult. I expected a few amens there or oh me's or something. Right? I, I, anybody ever have a problem because you're a follower of Christ? Or maybe you have a problem just because you're you. Right? Well, it's interesting because when James opens his letter, the first thing he talks about is problems. And a couple of weeks ago in our first part of this series, we talked about problems. And we talked about when we have problems, sometimes we churn, sometimes we burn, sometimes we yearn, or sometimes we learn. Everybody say learn. And that's really our goal, is to learn when we're in the difficulties of life. And the only way to learn in the difficulties of life is to develop the right perspective. Everybody say perspective. So the first week, we talked about perspective, the perspectives that we live with. And that's what James teaches us in the opening part of James chapter 1. Last week, we moved from perspective to perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. Perseverance, that's a fun word, isn't it? Here's what I've learned about life. Anything that's really worthwhile in life takes time. We live in a culture that loves instant everything, right? Instant potatoes, Lord help us. They're not near as good as Cindy's mashed potatoes. We like microwaves. If it takes more than five minutes to cook, it's like, what's wrong with it? We live in an instant culture. We, we watch a show on TV, and in 60 minutes, there's problems that are all get solved. If you're like me, I hate those series that keep going with the same problem. It's like, I was expecting it to be over. Perseverance. Now, there's a big difference between perseverance and patience. We talked about it last week. Patience is the passive acceptance of your circumstances. Perseverance, on the other hand, is courageous, active determination to push through your circumstances to a positive result. So last week we talked about perseverance. Those two messages are on our YouTube channel. If you want to go watch them, you're welcome to do that. Today we start in verse 5. Everybody say verse 5. So I, I preached for two weeks and we've made four verses. It's going to be a long study. Here we go. Verse 5, James chapter 1. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, anybody lack wisdom sometimes? I'll raise both hands. If any of you lacks wisdom, this is for you. You should ask what? Ask God. There you go. Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And then here's some instructions about asking. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is what? Double-minded and unstable in all they do. It's interesting that right after James talks about problems and the need for perspective and the need for perseverance, he says, and oh, by the way, while you're going through this perseverance, make sure you ask for wisdom for this journey. If anybody lacks wisdom, I've lived long enough to realize my wisdom is not enough wisdom. Now, there's a big wisdom difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. I've known a lot of people who have letters behind their name that tell me they have accumulated a lot of information. They went to school. They got degrees. I'm not against that. I'm in favor of it. I believe you need to get all the knowledge you can get. But knowledge without wisdom is really wasted. Because wisdom is the ability to know what to do with the knowledge. And we got a lot of dumb people with degrees. I remember I'm not supposed to use stupid because kids might be listening, okay? 
Have a, come on, you've met some folks who have degrees who can't get out of a paper sack. You know, and that's, you, you realize James didn't say if you lack knowledge, ask God. He said if you lack wisdom, ask God. And God will give you wisdom. That's what we want. I've known some people that were incredibly smart with what my mom and dad used to call just street smarts. You can get a long way with street smarts a whole lot further a lot of times than you get with your degrees. Well, I was expecting some amens, but we'll just go on. So how do we get that? James gives us three instructions here. If you're taking notes on your outlines, here we go. Number one, James says, ask God, and then Darius threw in this part before Google. Okay, you ready for that, guys? Ask God before Google. That's what he says, right? If you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Ask God. Ask God. Now, asking God is a theme in James' letter. In fact, if you jump over to James chapter 4, James tells us in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, you have not because you ask not. Go ahead and ask. If you lack wisdom, ask God. You don't have because you don't ask. I hope this morning that before you leave here, some of you that are recognizing, hey, you know what? I've got some decisions to make. I've got issues in my family. I've got issues in my finances. I've got issues on my job. I got issues with my marriage. Ask God for wisdom. Heard a great analogy the other day. Little boy, we'll call him Johnny. Johnny had loaded up all of his toys in, a, in his wagon. And I mean, some of them were really heavy. And, and Johnny was about six years of age, and Johnny was pulling his wagon across the street to his friend's house. And he got over to the curb, and he was trying to pull his little wagon up the curb, and he just couldn't get it there. And his dad happened to be watching from across the street. And his dad walked over to little Johnny and says, what you trying to do, Johnny? He says, Dad, I got to get this wagon up over the curb. And dad says, Johnny, I think you can get it there if you'll use all your strength, everything you got. So Johnny thought, okay, if dad thinks I can, I guess I can. So he locks his knees and legs, and he grabs a hold of that handle, and he starts, and he pulls it with everything he's got. It gets all the way up to the top, and then it just falls back down. And he just says, dad, it didn't work. And dad said, Johnny you got to use everything you got if you want to get it over the curb. But, Dad, I don't think I can. Johnny, you can if you use everything you got. So, I mean, man, he decides, okay, I'm going to get it. And he grabs and he pulls it. And, I mean, he leans back. It doesn't go. He starts to cry. And he says, Dad, I just can't do it. Well, son, did you use everything you got? And he says, yeah, Dad, I used everything I got. And Dad says, no, you didn't, son, because you never asked me to help you. <laughs> wow. How many times in life have we exhausted everything we have, and yet we failed to just stop and say, hey, God, could you help me? You see, God did not design you and I to be able to do this Christian life on our own. We're not smart enough. We're not fast enough. We're not strong enough. We don't have enough resources to be what God wants us to be by ourselves. He intentionally created every one of us so that we would need him to make it through this life to where God wants us to be. Some of you this morning have been straining at that wagon with all your might, and you think it just is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You haven't used everything until you've asked Him. And some of you today in this room, some of you watching me online today, today's going to be your day when you say, hey, God, I need your help. 
I love the story in 1 Kings. 1 Kings, David had died. He was the great king of Israel. He was the great warrior. His son Solomon has now been anointed as the new king of Israel. And it tells us in 1 Kings, do you have that? 1 Kings, there we are. 1 Kings chapter 3, it says, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, look what God says to Solomon. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now I want you to look at that a moment. How many of you would like to have a dream tonight that God just says, hey, what do you want? A blank check. Here it is. What would you ask for? Hey, God, you know that lottery is pretty big right now. Pastor preached this morning that we can ask for wisdom, so God, could you give me those numbers? <laughs> Maybe some of you would say, well, God, if I can get anything, I'd like health. Doctor's report's not too good. Some of you might say, well, God, if I could ask for anything, could, could you heal my marriage? Or heal my relationship with my kids or my grandkids? Maybe for some you would say, God, could you set me free from this addiction? God, could you give me some hope? A lot of things we could ask for. A lot of things Solomon could have asked for. But the very next verse tells us what Solomon did ask for. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 6. Or actually it goes to verse 9. Solomon says, Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, to distinguish between right and wrong, for who is able to, great, to govern this great people of yours? What's he asking for? Solomon says, God, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me the ability to know right from wrong? Would you give me the ability to discern what I'm supposed to do? That's exactly what James told us, right, in James chapter 1. If you lack wisdom... Ask God. And I like the last part of that verse. The Lord was what? Pleased that Solomon had asked for this. You could ask for anything. And he said, God, what I need is wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. And it says the Lord was pleased. And then if you go on and read the rest of the story in 1 Kings chapter 5, God was so pleased that Solomon asked for wisdom, God said, you didn't ask for wealth, you didn't ask for power, you didn't ask for fame, you asked for wisdom, so since you asked for wisdom, I'm not only going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you all the other stuff as well. You see, because if we have wisdom, then we have everything that we need in our lives. So what do, how do I get wisdom? I ask God, number one. Here's number two. Now James tells me, how do I ask? So this is number two on our outlines this morning. We are to ask with faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Ask with faith. Verse five, he says, look, when you ask, you must believe and not what? Not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow. So I ask in faith. Now, that always creates some interesting issues. Because we go, okay, I'm not sure I have faith for everything I need. How can I ask in faith? It's a great illustration of that in, in the Mark chapter 11. Jesus has gone into the city of Jerusalem, into the temple. He's on his way out of the temple, and he sees a fig tree over beside the road. And the fig tree has blossoms on it, which is supposed to be the sign that there is fruit there. It was evidently the time of year when fig trees were supposed to be bearing figs. And so Jesus, being a little hungry, goes over to the tree to get some figs. And there's no figs on the tree. It is a fruitless tree. And Jesus, interesting, I, I, 
I, I've studied this out, and I'm going to be just real honest with you. There's some things in Scripture I don't fully understand, and it's okay to just admit I don't understand. In fact, one of the most freeing things in life is when you reach the point to go, it's okay not to know everything. If I knew everything, I'd be God, and you don't want me to be God, so we're both okay. How y'all doing? So the Bible says Jesus curses the fig tree. You get the picture here. Je and now, I don't know if he was so hungry, he got hangry and just got mad and said, well, you stupid tree, die. We don't even know what he said. It just says he cursed the fig tree. And then they go on home. And the next day, the very next day, they are heading back into Jerusalem. And as they're passing by the road where the fig tree is, one of the disciples looks over and the fig tree is literally dead. It's shriveled up. And the disciples are going like, oh, wow. Jesus, look at the fig tree. It's dead. And Jesus responds with this statement in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Have faith in what? In God. That's an important part. You might want to underline those two words, in God. Have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, does not doubt in their heart, but believes that whatever they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Amen. Now, here's what grabbed me off of that whole little section there. Jesus did not say, have faith in your faith. Jesus did not say, have faith in your ability to solve the problem. Jesus just said, have faith in God. Whatever your problem is today, whatever circumstance you're facing, whatever area that you need wisdom in today, do you believe God is big enough for your problem? Not that you're big enough, not that you're righteous enough, not that you're good enough that you deserve it, because we, none of us do deserve it, but do you believe that God can do it? Our God is Jehovah God. Our God is Elohim. He is the God who literally spoke, said, let there be light, and light came into being. He is the God, the creator God, who created everything out of nothing. Our God never once in all of creation has ever woken up in the morning and said, oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. How y'all doing? Our God never paces the floor, wringing his hands, wondering what we're going to do about that. You get surprised. I get surprised. The doctor's report, the boss who suddenly tells us that our services are no longer needed at the company, we get surprised. God never gets surprised. He's the almighty God. So all that Jesus says is when you pray, when you ask God for wisdom, just have faith in God. God, you have wisdom that I don't have. Would you please give it to me? That's what it means. You don't have to have faith in your faith. In fact, I, I kind of like the story of the father who comes to Jesus one day wanting Jesus to heal his child. And Jesus says, do you believe that I can do this? And the father, I love this, the father says, Lord, I believe. Please help my unbelief. I love the honesty of that dad. Sometimes I think we can go to God, God, I believe you can fix this. Please help what I don't believe. Help me there, God. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But God is. So the question is, how big is your God? I've told you before, folks, you either have a really big God and little problems, or you have big problems and a little God. It all depends on which side you want to look at the most. The more time you spend in worship, the more time you spend in this word, the bigger God gets and the smaller your problems get. If you focus all the time on your problems, they begin to shrink the size of your God. Ask God in faith. 
And here's my third thought. Ask with a committed heart. Committed heart. Everybody say heart. This is important. Verse number 8 in our text today from James chapter 1. James says, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, there's a word picture here in the Greek, which is what our original text was written in. The word picture that he uses with the words that we, inter- that we translate double-minded and unstable is actually a word picture of a staggering drunk. A staggering drunk trying to walk down the street, going from side to side without making much progress. And he says, if you're uncommitted in your heart, if you haven't really developed faith in God, if you haven't committed your life to him as the Lord of your life and the purpose of your life, then you're going to live a double-minded, unstable existence. For about 10 years, I, I, I worked in youth ministry. That's where I got my start in ministry. And uh, I discovered in working with teenagers, and then as I became a pastor for the last 40 plus years, I began to discover that a lot of adults are just like the teenagers I worked with. Kind of like one foot in the church and one foot in the world. It's like Sunday morning, this is the way I act. Come Monday morning, I'm going to get over here. How y'all doing? Friday night, I'm over here. Sunday morning, I'm in here. I believe that's what James is telling us right here. You don't get wisdom from God until you're committed to God. I have people all the time who will ask me, Pastor, how do I hear from God? How do I get that wisdom? How, how can I, I've been asking God to give me direction in my life. How, how can I get direction? How can I know it's God and not just bad pizza, right? How do I get direction from God? Here, here's a great thought, okay? The ear that refuses to hear the voice of correction will not be able to hear the voice of direction. Because the same voice that corrects my life is the voice that directs my life. So if I say no when God tells me correction, then I shut my ears to that very voice that wants to give me direction. This is good stuff. So what do I have to do? I have to say to God, I'll do whatever you want me to do before I know what it is. Anybody use the Waze app? I'm a big fan of Waze. Four of us in the room. Okay, the rest of you need to get up on it, okay? It's the best app out there for driving, much better than Google Maps or any of that stuff because you know what Waze does? Waze is populated by people that are using it and it tells you where all the wrecks are and where all the police are. I, that, was, that was my wife. I, I have a problem. I've, I've, I'm getting better at it, but I do have a problem sometimes that I often think I can get more done in the particular time that I have than I really can. So I have historically had a struggle with running late, which means I have to speed up a little bit, especially when there are dumb people on the road going slow. Okay? And so I have discovered that Waze is an amazing app because it has, I have used it long enough where it understands my driving skills, abilities, and desires to get from point A to point B the fastest possible route. Okay? And because it knows traffic patterns, where a wreck is, where the police are, it will tell me where to go. Even though I already know how I normally get from here to there, I have now learned when I get in my car before I leave my house or before I leave the church office to head home, I punch in ways. It has it. The very first thing on my list is the Lighthouse Church. 
The, no, the first thing on my list is home, and the second thing is the Lighthouse Church. I'll punch them in there. It knows. This is the time of day you usually go here. Okay? Now, it's interesting because I'm one who kind of likes to know ahead. So I have discovered on ways how I can punch certain buttons to find out the whole pattern of where I'm going. But I've also learned that to get the best results of ways, I have to constantly consult it and watch it because invariably road conditions change. Last week, for instance, I, had, I don't remember what day it was, but I had, had a, I'd been here late and uh, for those of you who don't know, I live south of Fort Worth over in a little community called Burleson. And so typically I go south from the church. I hit 20, go 20 to 35 in Fort Worth and go south on 35. Straight, easy shot. I was in the parking lot up here by the office. When I got in my car, I, I punched in ways, right, home. And I set it over there. And then I had a phone call I had to make because I make lots of phone calls while I'm driving. And so... I'm, I'm on my phone. Well, when you're on your phone, you can't hear what Way says, so you have to, like, punch it so that you can see what it's to do. And I didn't look at it because I just thought, I'm, I'm going to go my normal route. And when I got out of the parking lot heading, it all of a sudden told me not to go to 20. And I'm thinking, why would I not go to 20? Instead, it put me on 67 to Middle Lothian. And I'm going, what in the world? And I had to make a choice. It doesn't seem right, but if Way says it, I'm going to go to Middle Ocean. <laughs> now, I did check to make sure I put in the right destination because I have found out, my wife found out the other day, she was heading over here. She put the wrong church in her ways, and it was sending her to North Fort Worth. And she thought, this is a weird way to get there. And then she realized, oh, no, I'm going to the wrong church. Let's go to a different lighthouse. Okay? Know where you're going first. This is just a little side line. Guess what? I committed to follow ways to Middle Othian. That night, you know what? I got home and found out there was a huge wreck on Interstate 20. Shut it down. Ways knew it was shut down. And they knew I needed to go south to be able to come back north to get to where I needed to be. Come on. I tell the staff a lot of times on Monday mornings when I'm coming over for staff meeting early on Monday mornings, it's a zoo trying to get 20. There have been days where it takes me all the way. I have seen more back roads than I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> I've discovered entire housing additions I never knew existed. Because I have committed myself to follow what Waze says because Waze knows more than I do. I know the roads. Ways knows the detours, knows the problems in front of me. Are you, are you ready for an application here? This is real simple. The Holy Spirit knows more about your tomorrow than you know about your today. The Holy Spirit knows every problem you're going to face this coming week. The Holy Spirit knows every problem your family's going to face this week. Every physical problem, every emotional problem, every financial problem, every relational problem, any problem you're going to face, the Holy Spirit already knows about it. He's not shocked. And if you'll ask him, you know what the Bible says? The Holy Spirit, who lives within us as followers of Jesus Christ, will reveal to us even the secret things of God. Those things I can't know simply by reading a book or intellectual knowledge. But I will have the mind of Christ. But you've got to commit to God's will before you even know it. That's why I love the story of Abraham. Abraham's the father of faith. This is my last verse. I'll talk about it in a moment as Pastor Jeremy comes. Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith, Abraham. Abraham was the father of faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed. Everybody say obeyed. He obeyed and went even though he did not know 
where he was going. Do you look at that? Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. If you want to get direction from God, you predetermined, God, my answer is yes, before I even know what you're asking. Have you made that decision? Have you made the decision to say yes to God before he tells you where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do? That's what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I believe you're smarter than me. And you have my yes before you even tell me where we're going. Church I grew up in several occasions many times there was a little song we used to sing I've asked Pastor Jeremy to lead us in this song today it says I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back second part says though none go with me still I will follow no turning back, no turning back. Third part says, the cross before me, the world behind me. I won't go back, I won't go back. This morning is a morning of predetermining where we're going. It's saying, God, I say yes to you so that I can get your wisdom. Because until he hears my yes, why would he waste time to give me direction? Because God's direction for my life is not up for my vote. That's pretty good. So would you join me this morning? Let's sing this as a prayer to the Lord. Would you help me, Jeremy? I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Would you bow your heads with me this morning and let's just take a personal moment between us and God. Would you just whisper a prayer and simply ask God, God, what are you saying to me? In your personal moment between you and God, what is God trying to say to you today? What is there in your heart and in your life that God is giving you a challenge to today. Maybe there's some area of your life that you know I haven't been obedient to the direction, the correction of God. And today you need to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. You're right. 
You see, God loves us so much. The Bible says 2,000 years ago, he sent his son Jesus to this earth. And when Jesus came to earth, he died on a cross. The reason he died on that cross was to pay the price for our sins. So that all of my failures, all of my sins, all of my mistakes, all of my habits, hang-ups, all of my addictions, all of my hurts were nailed on that cross so that I could not only live forgiven, but I could live free. But that freedom only comes to those who accept Jesus as God's plan of salvation. When we declare that Jesus is our Lord and that we are a sinner and we can't help ourselves, at that moment, God releases mercy and grace so regardless of who we are, where we've been, or what we've done, His mercy and grace sets us free, forgives us, and cleanses us. I believe there are some today in this room who would say, Pastor Darius, I need forgiveness today. I need cleansing. If that's you with heads bowed, eyes closed, this is between you, me, and God. You would say, Pastor Darius, today's my day. I want to say yes to God directing my life. If that's you, would you just lift up a hand? Hold it up there as if you're signing up for something. Just say, hey, this is me right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. I see him up, in the, up there in the balcony as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You get to make the call. I can't make it for you. Now, I'm going to ask everybody to stand with me this morning and look at me right here, okay? I think about four people, five people maybe raise their hands in the room. So this is a real important moment. We just sang the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. We're going to make it more than a song. We're going to make it an act. Here's what I'm going to invite, just a moment. Those of you today who are here and you would say, Pastor Darius, today I, I, I need to commit myself to say, yes, God, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, I can't help myself. I need your help. I'm gonna invite you, what I'm gonna invite you to do in just a moment is come and join me right down here at the front. We're gonna have a prayer together. Some of our prayer team is gonna come and pray with us. And we're gonna experience God's grace and mercy. Now some of you are gonna say, well, if I walk down there, what are people gonna think? They're gonna think you want freedom and you want forgiveness. Are they gonna think are they going to think I'm a horrible person? No, they're going to think you're pretty smart. Because there's nobody in this room who is a follower of Christ who hasn't made that walk. Some of us, like me, made it several times. Because God's grace is also progressive in my life. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Darius, I'm willing to take that step. And I'm willing to say, yes, I'm deciding to follow Jesus. I ask you right now, would you just step out from wherever you are up there in the balcony? Down here on the lower floor, would you just come and join me right up here? Would you do that? Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Give them a hand as they come down, would you please? You want to come? You want to join me? It's your call. Lord, I come against any principalities or power of the devil that would try to block your life that wants to be released today. Holy Spirit, would you give a courage to take a bold step, a step of love, a step of faith. God, would they just experience your love through this body today? Do your work, Lord. Pray with me a moment. Okay. The 
give my second invitation for those who would say, Pastor Darius, I need some wisdom in my life. Then this morning, I want God to know I need his wisdom. I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to ask God, and I'm going to believe that the problems that I'm facing, God's able to give me the wisdom on how to make it through that. I'd love to be able to just have a moment of prayer with you. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you if, you, if you're here, whoever you are, and you say, hey, I, I got some issues. Maybe it's family issues, finances, physical issues, relational issues, whatever it is. But I need some wisdom in my life. I'm going to invite you to just step out from where you are. Come and join me right up here. And we're going to take a moment to pray together. Would you do that? Come on, give them a hand as they come. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, both of them. Thank you, Fred. Good morning, man. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Darius. What's your name? Destiny. Destiny. What a beautiful name. Okay. Hi, good morning, Fred. I'm Darius. What's your name? Carlos, I thought so, Carlos. Good to see you again, man. Hi, good morning. I'm Darius. Christian. Christian? Nice to have you, man. Thank you. Great to have you here. Thank you. I don't think I've met you before, have I? Okay. It's a great... Oh, Tino's your dad? I won't hold that against you. <laughs> okay? Good to be here, man. Okay, well, thanks. Now, church family, would you... Hi, good morning. Hi. I'm Darius. Anthony. Okay, Anthony. I, I'd like some of the church family in prayer team. Would you just come and stand behind our friends and put a hand on their shoulders? Would you do that for me? Just help me out. Come and step up here. Wow. It's a neat moment. I just, I, I think when we have a moment to pray together that I, I don't like people to pray by themselves. The Bible says something incredible happens when we pray one for another. Amen. Right? Life's way too tough to do by ourselves. We need God and we need some partners. If I could have a couple of men, I need a couple of men right over here to help me. And man, I just want to make sure we got somebody standing with each person here. Church family, would you stretch out your hands toward our friends? Father, right now, I just pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever's going on in their life, whatever circumstance they're facing, Lord, they, they stand here in front of you asking you today for wisdom. And Lord, I believe according to your word that you give wisdom to those who ask. So God, I break down every barrier in our minds or in our hearts and we open ourselves up to you right now. Holy Spirit, I ask you to do miracles of grace. I ask you to do miracles of life, of hope. I curse the darkness. I curse the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the panic that would separate them from your grace and your mercy. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we believe you right now for your presence to come upon them. Thank you, God, for pouring your love into them right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, those of you that are standing here, would you just do, would you just thank God right now? Just by faith, say, God, I thank you because you're in charge. I thank you that you are guiding my life. I thank you that you are my Lord. Nothing is too big for you. I give it to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for that right there. Would you do that for me? Hey, Christian. Good morning. Good choice this morning. Bless you. Hi, friend. Good morning. God bless you. Thanks for coming. You may go back to your seats. Thank you all very much. You may be seated in the audience.